tail light. You'll notice, too, that the overall proportions of the car are considered. That the dimensions from the rocker panel up to the belt molding, and hence to the top of the car, are kept in good balance to flatter the overall length as well as uh, the uh, overall height of the vehicle. In the back, uh, you will notice the turn indicators on this experimental job. It was, uh, uh, we thought that it would be a good idea to get them up high where uh, they could be more readily seen from the rear. And this also features a, a cantilever roof, a new type of construction which allows the elimination of structural pillars in the side. You see, too, an entirely novel glass treatment with full wraparound glass in the roof quarter area. Now on the top, something new was done in a butterfly type of roof opening. This transparent section uh, opens when the car door is opened, which simplifies the ability of getting in and out of the car. When the door is closed on the outside, uh, this returns to its normal position. Now you can see the complete custom-made automobile fully approved by Ford Motor Company executives. As I said before, this car was made for both show purposes and for investigating design ideas, getting reactions to them. But if we were doing it uh, to mass produce it, let me give you an idea of the work that would be ahead. All of the styling ideas would have to be squared uh, with other minds. Here, a new idea is being examined by an engineer and a cost estimator who must approve every item on the new car before it can be considered for mass production. Then draftsmen go to work on the insides of the car, carrying out engineering specifications. One man works on the blueprints for a new automatic transmission. Another makes the tools which will be used to put the car together. Then the parts are spread out full size on a sheet of aluminum. From this sheet, templates are formed which will be used in the making of a wooden model, carved by hand, just as the clay model was formed. The measurements are checked for exactness within a thousandth of an inch. From this wooden model, dies will be cast and parts formed from these dies. These parts will be used to make a single custom model, an experimental car, which can be used to test the new ideas under driving conditions. At the same time, men have been working with the same care on a new engine. When ready, it is mounted on the new chassis, and the whole car begins to take the shape that it took in the minds of the stylists and the engineers. Then the car is tried out on the test track, where all the different punishments a car meets are simulated. And in the testing laboratories, other punishment is inflicted on this carefully built prototype to find out where the weaknesses are. Here, rough roads are manufactured. Indoor showers will tell whether the car is weatherproof. Springs are challenged to see if they can stand up to abuse. There's even a collision machine to see how much damage will be done by different forces. Tireless machines open and close trunks and doors. And even glove compartments. Seat cushions are set on by postures of steel. Hour after hour, frames and bumpers are vibrated to seek out the rattles. Meanwhile, the model you saw on the test track had been driven 50,000 miles. At the end of that time, it is completely broken down. All its 12,000 parts are separated, carefully weighed and photographed to find out what happened to them during that 50,000 miles of hard driving. With all the bugs taken out, the car would be ready for mass production techniques, which will make thousands of cars in its image. The assembly line at the Ford Motor Company puts together one new car every 56 seconds, 24 hours a day. Well, Mr. Bordenay has been telling you about the other cars. I've been listening very attentively, but I've been looking very carefully at this model. Mr. Bordenay, I believe you call this model the Taj Mahal. Well, that's right, Mr. Poole. It's uh, an advanced model. It hasn't been carried as far as uh, the XM Turnpike Cruiser. 
but uh, it's been completed in this fiberglass with uh, plastic and chrome plating, as you see here. Well, I know that one question you'd want me to ask, Mr. Bordenay, and that is this. Where do you start? Where, how does your imagination begin so that you create a design? Well, uh, when you're in this business and your work involves a search for something new and better all the time, you find yourself getting inspiration, if you want to call it that, from everything you see. A common heat register in a home can suggest a design for grill work. You can get an idea for a taillight from, uh, oh, say, the shape of a tree leaf. You constantly see all the shapes in the world in terms of their adaptation to automobile styling. Uh, this is a pretty conscious effort at first, but it soon becomes second nature. Of course, in this day, the motif of speed is a very popular one. People want a car to look like it's going somewhere even when it's standing still. Now, we got an idea for a rear quarter section, which is uh, the section of the car that you see uh, right here. From, uh, say, uh, oh, a shark's tail or uh, an airplane fuselage. On the XM Turnpike Cruiser, uh, these impact units were uh, suggested by the B-52 uh, bomber. And you can see that they're a fairly accurate translation of them. The stylists who design instrument panels get ideas from airplanes, too, as uh, well as from clocks and, and watch designs. Well, Mr. Bordenay, just as in, in all uh, businesses and all professions, you get a jargon of your own. You, you have sort of a language. I wish you'd explain some of the words that you use when describing automobiles. Well, let me see. I think we... Talked about impact bars. Uh, right. Now, that's the bumping surface. Used to be known as a bumper once a long time ago, well, how about I think. the pork chop? Well, the pork chop is uh, this area of the car right here. It's actually covered by the uh, closed door. It was brought about when the wraparound windshield came into vogue. It's the portion, that, the structural portion, that supports the A-pillar, and it's given its name because it actually looks like a pork chop. Uh, some of the other areas of the car would be, uh, say, rocker panel. That's the uh, portion, structural portion that runs along the base of the car under the doors. The belt line is the uh, part right in through here. Uh, the greenhouse uh, is, as the name implies, the area above the belt which has all of the windows, uh, which incidentally we call lights. Uh, for example, a backlight back here rather than that. A rear window. Now, there are many others. But well, while you're, <clears throat> you're explaining them all, let me go to this. this. This obviously is one of my favorites that you've been able to show us. When is a dream car like this going to actually come true? Well, I don't think you'll ever see an absolute translation of a car like this, Mr. Poole. That is right into production. But it will be a feeding ground for uh, new ideas. Actually, to a large extent, it depends on which price category you're talking about. A, a low-priced car can never be designed too far ahead of its time, uh, since it must appeal to a large group of people in order to be mass-produced and sold inexpensively. Uh, radical designing of a car is apt to be a costly thing. Uh, the public's pretty timid about accepting something too new or too different. And if you're making a car which is priced to be sold to millions and millions don't buy it, well, uh, you know what happens. In the automobile business, you have to sell a lot of cars to uh, reach the financial break-even point. But where price makes the market more exclusive, uh, you can afford to turn out a car which will uh, provoke violent reactions, pro and con, uh, uh, such as this one would. Uh, but as uh, long as there are enough pros, uh, you can profitably make a car that's quite different. Well, earlier this evening, I had the opportunity of asking Mr. Bordenay a number of questions. And one of those questions was, if you want to get into this business of styling, what do you do? Well, his answer was very briefly this. The first thing you have to do is have an interest in automobiles to carry you along. Then also, study your art in high school. Then go to one of the art schools around the country that has specialized courses in design and styling. What would some of those schools be, Mr. Bordenay? 
Well, we've found that uh, we've gotten uh, a lot of talent from the Cleveland School of Art in Ohio. Uh, Cleveland Institute of Art is the correct name, I believe. And the Art Center School, uh, Los Angeles, California. And the um, uh, Philadelphia Museum School. Well, let's say that uh, I have completed the course and I've gotten all the background I can. Do you really want me in this business? Is there room for me? Well, you try my imagination, Mr. Poole, but if you had done these things, <laughs> yes, we'd want you. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'm right now in the process of... Uh, I just left Cleveland yesterday, uh, where we interviewed a number of students. As a matter of fact, hired three of them. And uh, am going to Philadelphia tomorrow, and I imagine I'll get out to the coast a little later in the season. So you are actually looking for people, and you see there really <clears throat> is that future that I mentioned some time ago. But speaking of the future, Mr. Bordenay, let's throw ourselves completely to the wind. What do you see in the future for automobiles? Well, uh, tomorrow, 10 years, mm, 70 I, years. Uh... I'm not interested in <laughs> 10 years. I'm interested in 70 years from now. Let's really dream. Well, I don't think I'll ever make it, Mr. Poole, but uh, I like to dream about it myself. And I can envision cars uh, that would be designed, for example, uh, to be attached to some superhighway with uh, hands-off controls, uh, with guide rails, perhaps, for the wheels, uh, with radar to uh, alert the car to uh, possible traffic dangers ahead and bring it automatically to a stop. Or possibly uh, some type of car with... Uh, magnetic poles uh, in opposition to one another, which would allow it to float a foot or so off the ground. And, of course, it would be uh, pulled toward its destination by uh, electronic impulses. Uh, maybe we could even shoot them in tubes with compressed air or something like, like that. Like those pneumatic tubes we used to have exactly. in department stores. Very much like that, yes. Well, let's go even a little further, Mr. Bourdain, while we're really, while we're really <laughs> dreaming here. What about the possibility of an automobile that is rocket propelled, that can go on the land or up into the stratosphere? Well, I like to think that that uh, is in the future and uh, perhaps not as far away as we think. Uh, for example, uh, if we had one with, say, uh, athodynes or uh, these devices that uh, are like propellers in, in capsules that uh, could be incorporated right into the car, get it off the ground so we could jump over some of the traffic. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a that would be a big help in cities today. But I'm sure that uh, you envision in the future, as everyone else does, new automobiles, new powers, new metals, new everything. Yes. So if you're looking into the future for a job that's really exciting, perhaps you'd like to think about the stylist. Because when you're working with styling of automobiles, you're working with people. And that's a very exciting thing. Now, if this doesn't appeal to you, but you're interested in working with people, be with us next week when we have a show about people working with people, and that is human relations. Tomorrow's Careers is produced by Lynn Poole. Associate producers Leo Geyer and Edmund Levy. Directors are Kennard Kelsey and Herbert B. Cahan. Art direction by Barry Mansfield. Your narrator has been Ted Jaffe. Furniture courtesy Gomprecht and Benish, Baltimore. The 1912 Model T, courtesy Mr. Ed Hook. Portions of this program have been mechanically reproduced. Tomorrow's careers originates through the facilities of WAAM in Baltimore. This is ABC Television Network.